So on to today's topic. Our panelist today is Michael Voss. Uh, Michael's been on these webinars previously uh, with the internal auditing one. Michael is one of Australasia's leading compliance consultants. He's the owner of Pixis Consulting. Michael is a past development director for the New Zealand Organisation for Quality. So welcome, Michael, and uh, over to you for today's presentation. Oh, thank you very much, Craig, and, and welcome, everybody. It's, it's great to have the opportunity to once again talk to you uh, folks and hopefully uh, add some value to, to, to what you're doing um, in your organisations. Now on, on today's topic. In New, here in New Zealand, uh, we've had the results of a Royal Commission inquiry into our health and safety record. And also, you've probably seen on your news the Pike River mine disaster where we had 29 miners lost their lives uh, back in December in 2010. By world standards, it doesn't make good reading, our track record here in New Zealand. Workers over here are six times more likely to be harmed in our workplaces compared with Australia. And against UK figures, we actually look even worse. New Zealand government has said that's enough and they've set a target of a 25% reduction uh, by 2020, and they're targeting 10% reduction by next year. And we've got some tough new legislation that's going through to make sure that directors and the officers of our companies will make safety more important than anything else, including returns for shareholders. And it will hurt their pockets if they don't. And you can see here um, up to $300,000 or a prison sentence for individuals uh, who have responsibilities for companies. And companies are collectively responsible for up to $3 million uh, if they step out of line. So let's dive into ISO 9001 and see what the minimum requirements for management review actually are. But before I do, you should be aware, if you're not already aware, that there is a new revision of the ISO 9001 standard that's currently in the committee draft. It's expected to be released in September this year. And in this re revision, we'll see all the clause numbers will change to comply with the Annex SL uh, standard, which will mean that all management standards will actually use the same clause number. So this is going to make it a lot easier for people to integrate their management systems. For example, if you look at the information security standard, ISO 27001, which was released last year, uh, which does conform to this new Annex SL numbering scheme, uh, then you'll see that you can read uh, there that management review in that standard comes out at, at uh, section 9.3. And this year we're of course expecting ISO 9001, the quality management standard, but also 14001, the environmental standard. They will both comply with the new uh, Annex SL. We're going to have to wait until 2017, however, for the new health and safety international standard, ISO 14001, to come out. 40. Uh, 45,000. 45,001, that's right. When this is completed, the rollout of, of Annex SL across all of the management system standards, it's going to make it really easy for us to see the requirements for collectively right across those standards for something like management review. Because all we've got to look at is just clause 9.3 in any one of those standards. So management review, which is currently clause 5.6, changes to 9.3. As a result of this, I've actually referred to the new clause numbers in my ISO 9. That I'm using mainly the wording from the 2008 revision of the standard, uh, because it's still unclear what the final text is going to be in the 2015 revision of the standard. We've got a pretty good idea, but uh, I just didn't feel comfortable about putting the committee draft in here, although I have made some references to that. So firstly, if we look at management review, what does it say? It says top management shall review the organisations. Now you'll see here I've used integrated here. For ISO 9001, the committee draft, and, and also anything to do with ISO 9000, 
uh, you can insert in front of management system the word quality. If it's environmental, it'll be environmental uh, for 14,001. And I'm sure when 45,001 comes out, it'll say something like occupational health and safety management system. So it says here, top management shall review the organization's management system at planned intervals to ensure its continuing suitability, adequacy and effectiveness. So let's just dive down what do these words mean. To be suitable, it means the integrated management system has to be fit for all its defined purposes. So it's got to fit the, biz the purpose of the actual business. Adequacy. As a minimum, the management system needs to meet the regulations, the contracts, and all of the other regulatory and standard codes of practice and so on, the framework in which the business has to operate in. And this includes things like the health and safety legislation, which I referred to before, as well as legislation like the Companies Act and so on and so forth. Effectiveness. This means that the business can achieve what it set out to do. So it's the extent to accomplishing what we call the planned activities and also achieving those planned results. So these three things are what TAP needs to do. And of course, naturally, it needs the information to be fed to it in order to do this effectively. Management review is not an ad hoc activity. It has to be planned and it needs to be able to adapt to the changing business environment. It also needs to be aligned with strategy. And you'll notice also that records also need to be kept of the information that's received by top management and of the decisions they make. And one of the things, one of the changes, key changes in the ISO um, 9001 for this year is an actual fact where leaders have to be able to demonstrate much better some of these new responsibilities that they have around these areas. So record keeping in these areas are even become more important today than they were have been in the past. Can I can I just pause you there? So what do you mean yeah. by top management? Is that how do you define it? Is that the CEO? Is it the board? Or what what does top management mean? Good good question. I, I would I would regard this as not a governance issue although there are areas, of course, which governance really care about. So in other words, the board has some interest in it because, of course, of their judicial responsibilities uh, to not harm people and so on in their workplaces that they are ultimately governing. But I think from a top management perspective, we really are talking about CEO and senior management teams of organisations. So see, the top management have to be involved in management review. The, the, the important word there is involved. So maybe maybe later on we talk about that involvement. Do they have to be there? Do they do they just get reports and things like that? So well, I think the issue comes the issue comes back to the previous slide I said, which was um, you know that they you you've still got to prove that your new management review. Let's just go back one slide. It, we never we can never lose sight of the fact that what what management review is about is to ensure the management system's continuing suitability, adequacy and effectiveness. It's all of those three things that are absolutely essential. So I think big picture wise we can never lose sight of that. Now if that means there are some responsibilities that fit around the board in order to do that from a governance perspective that's fine because I think a lot of boards uh, there is a muddying of shall we say the waters between what managers actually do and what the board actually does in terms of governing organisations. Some boards have very much hands-on hands -on activities day to day in the running of the organisation where I would say some of those activities are actually more what I would describe as top management. So I don't think we can actually look at a particular group of people and say it's always going to sit with these particular people. Right, yeah because because um I recommend to people read the uh, Pike River book by uh, Rebecca McPhee uh, that talks about um, the lack of management review 
uh, there. So you can see you, you, you get a lot of good learnings from that book where top, top management aren't, haven't been involved or don't review or don't um, or haven't conducted good management review of their systems and so top management weren't aware of certain failings within the systems so that's a good book to read if people want to read about uh, how poorly management review can be quite catastrophic yep absolutely yeah no that's good thanks for that Craig okay um, the the other the other area Oh, um, so so back onto this. So really, there is a lot of importance on area which I think a lot of external auditors will be starting to put a little bit more attention to to uh, top management, but also to boards, and saying, well, where is the proof? Where are the records? Where are the evidence that top management are in fact doing these things? Um, so I think there is going to be much more. I think magnifying glass put on organisations to make sure their records are a lot tidier around these things. Certainly a lot tidier than the uh, than what we used to do in, in the old organisation when I used to be there around management review it was a pretty pretty lightweight in terms of records. But I think we can expect that that's going to change. So that's certainly got to be an area I would suggest that people uh, would be uh, well well versed to actually have a look at. And say, do we have sufficient evidence? that we can prove that we are meeting the actual requirements for management review. Um, so at this point I just, I just want to focus on uh, what sort of information it is that top management should be looking at. Because once again we can go to the standard here and it's really what was in the old um, inputs clause of ISO 9001. Um, so here there is a very, very useful list of all of the uh, inputs that go in there. You'll see here, for example, management review shall con include consideration of the status of actions from previous management reviews, um, which is a little bit more perhaps than just having a look at the uh, accepting the previous minutes of the, the management review, which is what we, uh, what we and a number of other companies seem to do, without checking to see whether it, the actions had actually been closed out and um, effectively. Uh, and you'll see there item B. Uh, that changes in the external and internal issues that are relevant to the management system. Uh, so a lot of the changes that used to be discussed here were in fact internally driven. You'll notice here there's a lot more emphasis on looking at these external parties. So changes in the external environment are issues which now need to be discussed not only discussed at management review, brought to management review, discussed, decide what outputs, what outcomes, what actions are resulting from that. And that of course requires evidence. So records need to be created of those to prove that in actual fact this part of the clause of that uh, will be met. Then there's information on the performance of the integrated management system. So leading you to say, okay, we've now got to look at trends and indicators for things like non-conformities, corrective actions, which of course we've done in the past. The monitoring and measurement of results has always been there, but I don't think it's been particularly clear just quite what that meant, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Also, the results of audits have always been there, uh, so no surprise there. Customer feedback has always been there. Uh, supplier and external provider issues, not particularly well done in my view in the past but that's a bit stronger here, recognising the fact that a, an organisation cannot be successful without suppliers and external providers, uh, and also of course uh, process performance and product conformity, they've always been there before, and it has opportunities for continual improvement. So no real great surprises there in terms of those inputs, uh, although some, some, some key changes. Looking now at the outputs, include decisions that relate to continual improving improve, improvement opportunities. So once again, the focus is on continually improving the organisation, but also note there any need for changes to the integrated management system. So these could be internally driven or externally driven. 
Okay, so uh, you'll notice here. Uh, oh no, um, you'll notice here also. I, I lost the word uh, quality, which of course uh, was in the old uh, 5.6 um, reference to the quality management system to integrate it as well, um, as I as I have, as I mentioned earlier. Um, just moving on now to the typical compliance approach that people have taken in the past around management review. The traditional approach to management review has always been to conduct a management review annually. So when I first became responsible for the company's uh, integrated management system, I was told by actually by our certification body, the auditor there, uh, that management review involves a meeting a year. Um, since then I've become, shall we say, much more enlightened and thankfully also the world has moved on. The standards are very useful in providing you with a list of information that needs to be considered during management review and this is the kind of list that you would expect to see there uh, in response to the inputs that we saw in the previous slide. So things like corrective actions, things like monitoring results, uh, measurement results, results of audits, your customer feedback, your supplier and external provider issues as we talked about before. So all of these items, no great surprise, they come straight out of the standard. However, there are other reviews that the business actually does carry out. And this include things like board meetings, which may be quarterly or even monthly. And management and the board will usually also review things like legal and regulatory environment, the risks to the business, our strategic plans and other reviews and so on. So in my experience, a lot of these activities occur in silos. So the board will do their review, the senior management team will do theirs, and department managers will also do their reviews. And no one person or no one group has actually perspective over all of these reviews. So these reviews may be operationalized and integrated to make them much more effective right across the organization. I also find that timing is also a serious issue with most organisations. I still find far too many ISO certified companies that still conduct a management review every 12 months and yet their whole business may change within this period of time. That requires their integrated management system to change more rapidly. So let me give you an example. If you design and manufacture smartphones, you're probably likely to release a new product into the market every three months. With each new product will come changes which are most likely going to affect the integrated management system. So changes to the IMS much must match that of the speed of the marketplace that you've chosen to operate in and with the speed with which you release new products into it. So management review to be effective needs to also operate the same speed or perhaps faster to add value, further value to the business. So an annual management review in this business would be nothing more than really a box ticking exercise. And in my experience, that's what I see a lot of management reviews being like, still in a lot of businesses today. I now just want to get a little perspective on the whole business. And to do this, I'll bring in the performance excellence framework. Can, can I just pause you there, yeah, Michael, just, be sure. just before you go on? So, so you've got boards quarterly management doing say strategic planning and financial reviews and maybe staff reviews at various frequencies and you've also got the management review so you're saying look at it all and combine these things and and make them more uh, effective in a com in a combined way is that what you're suggesting C correct I'm not necessarily saying integrate these although if you can if you can integrate activities sense on a time time and audience then that increases effectiveness across the organization so if you've got a group of people sitting around the table and they're discussing various aspects of the business say it's around risk uh, then there's there's bound to be some other activities which should be reported at that same meeting and could well add value to the overall review process by combining activities where you've got the same audience and it's an appropriate audience, an appropriate topic to be discussing. 
I mean, I guess that's the terminology. I, I, I tend to call it operationalizing. Uh, I guess um, lean people would call it sort of standardizing stuff, um, but that's really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about grab these kinds of activities, all these activities, look at them, decide which ones logically go together, which ones should be uh, carried out more often, less often, uh, work out whether in fact these activities should be carried out by senior management team at all. Maybe they should be carried out by uh, people a little lower down the organization. Um, so it's not a one size fits all, it's a matter of just looking at all of these review activities and then decide as an organization which ones make sense to be carried out by which groups of people within the organization mm -hmm. and avoid a lot of duplication. Yeah, because you don't want one group looking at exactly the same stuff as another group. So. And in my experience, that's what you find, Craig. Yeah, yeah. The the other thing I also, when I did my um, my blog on management review, is is I suggested that you have a meeting to to run your management yep. review. And I got a lot of criticism from the the pedants who told me, well, you, the stand it doesn't yep. actually say you need to have a meeting. But uh, of all the companies I've audited and visited, and everybody. I can only really think of one company that doesn't have a management review meeting. They just do it via email with reports and things are discussed through through email. So my my I always suggest have a meeting because then, you know, it, things are minuted, it's clearly actions are clearly defined and, and what's your what's your view on 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 meetings versus not having meetings? Yeah, look, good, good question. Um, I, I guess, I guess we can't lose sight of the fact that that you know, man's a social being, and and we do tend to like to do these things face to face, or or a virtual face to face, or the equivalent of it. Man, man or man or woman, don't forget. Yes, man or woman. Sorry, I'm using a very generic uh, Homo sapiens type um, <laughs> description here. Please don't, please don't shoot me because I don't have any females in my organisation. Um, yeah, look, um, I mean, the, 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 the ISO standard does not say that you have to have a meeting. Um, and I think if you can meet the requirements without having a meeting, I think that's great. I think we do generally in our organisations, I think when we do have meetings, I think it's a situation where we, get, where we can get far more effective management review functions, let's describe it that way, by conducting a meeting. I'm not suggesting it's all day, because that was another thing that I found. A lot of organizations that I came across would sit down and discuss these things for a whole day, and I think, well, mm, that's which is, nonsense. Which comes to a question from Jose, who's saying, how long should a management review meeting take, barring all data and follow-ups are presented? Well, I would say it, it ranges. I, I have seen... But it's uh, not all day. <laughs> it's not all day, no. Although it may be all day, but I would suggest it's not the review that is taking all day. It's the outcomes that have come out of the review, which is occupying management uh, in a much, much longer period of time. I mean, my view of meetings is that these are not occasions to present information um, necessarily. I think all information should be presented to people way prior to any meeting, because meetings are expensive. They're probably one of the most expensive activities uh, that an organization can be engaged with. When you consider the collective salaries of the people around the table and the potential lost opportunity cost, you cannot afford to have people reading documents and uh, during a meeting like that. All of that prep work should have occurred prior to that. Uh, but when you get a team of people who are properly prepared and raise their points during a meeting, uh, you find that it's the outcomes you could never, ever have achieved. Because you should be reviewing, you, you, you're reviewing your system, right? You, you're not actually solving yeah. every single corrective action or every, um, you know, you're not reviewing every single accident. You're looking at your systems and saying, what could we do better? How could we improve the system 
that that's really what the review is doing, isn't it? You're not you're not solving every little little problem. No, no, that's dead right. You know, and as we said before, it's about is the integrated management system suitable for our business, given the fact that since the last time we hit met, uh, things have changed. Have they changed sufficiently where we have to rebuild it from the ground up? Are we a different business now to what we were the last time we met and considered? Is our management system suitable for our organisation? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I believe the speed with which businesses work, the speed with which industries operate today, it can quite easily get forgotten about unless we try to operationalise key aspects of it. Mm -hmm. here's, a, here's a tricky question uh, from Stuart who's asking, what about a laboratory who has 17025 but the rest of the organisation has no quality management system? Who gets involved in the review for the 17025? Uh, good question. Um, once again, I go back to I would go back to the uh, the standard and say, is the yeah, are the people who are involved in oversight overseeing the laboratory are they all of the people who need to be there to to make the assessment about whether the integrated management system that is in place in the laboratory is suitable and effective and all those other things. So it's probably not the CEO who who maybe may have a general manager underneath them that looks after the laboratory or something like that. Correct. However, I would still push. I would still push very hard for the CEO to get engaged. Right. This is this is where this is where the TC one seventy six working group are really unhappy about um, uh, ISO nine thousand one. The delegation of this role of management representative down to a level where um, the CEO doesn't have to have anything to do with it. Right. You know, and we do have these changes that, that the, the leadership needs to not only be engaged but prove that they are engaged in promoting uh, mm -hmm. quality management and good quality practice. So, so you're, suggest you're suggesting for Stuart that he should have the CEO involved in, in the management review? Of the, I, the, of I would, I would, I would certainly suggest that that is a an aim that um, Stuart should go for uh, is to, and I know this is this is tough stuff, but you can always blame the changes to the ISO 9001 standard. But he's um, looking, he's that, he's got 17025, so that's a different standard. Yeah, yeah but the thing is, you see, seven based on a 9001 core, so it's only a matter of time before. Um, I would imagine that working group um, would would have a look at that and then say, okay, well, we could get some benefit out of saying the same thing in that standard. Mm -hmm. We've got so Sonia. Oh, I agree. So it's not now. Yeah, Sonia's come up with a suggestion. I would suggest that for the lab, uh, people who control the resources should be pre uh, present. I agree. You very quickly get to a situation here. Yeah. You know, uh, when, when I talk about the outputs, it'll be pretty clear about um, okay. about, about that. But Sorry, I... Sonia's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a resource. It comes down to who who controls the resources. If you've got a group of people around the table who cannot swing resources to get things um, changed in terms of uh, integrated management system, then you haven't got the right people around the table. So Sonia's absolutely correct. Okay, so let's. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's all right. That's fine. It's important we answer those questions, not necessarily what I've got prepared. <laughs> okay, okay so you've got your criteria. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, so I'm just going to I'm just going to gather some altitude now and just talk talk about from a different perspective, um, a different lens, if you like, the performance excellence framework lens. Um, so I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with this, but let me just walk you very quickly through this. Um, the criteria framework really just provides a view on, an, well, on what an integrated system looks like. So whenever, whenever somebody can, says to me, well, what does an integrated system look like? I always pull out the criteria. I don't go and try and grab all the different management standards and try and line them all up and say, well, this is what it all means. Uh, I always go to the criteria framework because to me, this is, this is the ultimate way of looking at um, an integrated, integrated system. 
So this is where over the left hand side we've got leadership, strategy and customers over here and this is, this is commonly the driver of the organisation. Have strategy, understanding what customers want and that drives the organisation. You've got the workforce and operations which drive the results. And you've got the connection between these two are this foundation, what we call category four. And this is the, the foundation is what we know, what we measure and analyse to improve the organisation. The organisational profile, so that's this bit at the top, really defines the environment the business operates in, its relationships and its strategic challenges. And it's this profile which makes every organisation unique. So everything else from the organisational profile down is actually consistent and the same for every organisation. doesn't matter who they are, whether they're a not-for-profit organisation, whether they've got shareholders, whether they're a privately owned company, it doesn't matter. So in the framework, management review sits down here. In four. It's in the foundation. Yeah, in, ca in category four. It's down here in this measurement analysis and knowledge management area because it's part of the analysis, the measurement and analysis that we need to invoke here. So it's just like a foundation of any building. We rely on it to keep the building strong and to prevent it from failing. Management review actually links the driver, um, leadership strategy and customers to results and operations and workforce. So it's this connection in through here. So in other words, management review connects every part to every other part of the business. We can actually represent this in a process form, which might be easier for some of you from the ISO world. So management review must get accurate information on the performance of the business, as I said before, from all of the areas of the business. Not, from, not just from results, but from operations, from the uh, workforce, from leadership, from strategy, from customers, all over the business in order to make the correct decisions to make improvements and changes that are needed. And the kinds of things that the world's highest performing organisations do is they identify best practice and they share it. They use these findings to project future performance and they also implement breakthrough changes and innovation as well as taking part in continuous improvement activity. So from a business excellence perspective, this is the function of management review. So the flow of information to management is really critical here to make sure they focus on the few parts of the business that will have the greatest effect. The input to management review is these performance improve, sorry, performance review measures. And this is what we in QHSE manager positions can influence because it's one of the most important things we do, actually report to managers. Let's now look at who's carrying out these review activities. If you like, the customers of the information they need to decide on performance improvements that they need to make. The customers include the decision makers from across the entire structure of the business. So boards typically make decisions on company strategy and action plans. Senior management teams make decisions on company operations within the constraints of those plans. And then decision making authorities often delegated down to individual departments and even to work areas where leaders are reviewing information and making decisions often on a daily basis. So you see, as I said earlier, we've got this we've got these reviews occurring right throughout the organization, right through from the board, right down to work area lead. So traditionally management review has involved the activity that the senior management team performs. But what the board does is far more important than what the SMT does. So in my experience, some of the decisions that are made by department managers and even supervisors can have a significant impact on the adequacy and effectiveness of the integrated management system. And of course those things are really critical as far as meeting the requirements of the ISO 9001 standard is concerned. 
So these also have to be considered as part of management review. So what we're saying now is it's not as clear to say that senior management team are the only ones who carry out all of the checks and balances to see whether the integrated management system is adequate and effective. By delegating some of these reviews down further down the organisation, there's some vital information that's carried out by people other than the senior management team. So what we need to do is to make sure there's a reasonable flow of data and information up to that senior management team level if they're going to be the ones who are going to control the resources. Can I, can I, just, pause, can, can I just pause you there? So yep. you, you talked about these performance measures. Are you talking about, say, for quality, it's customer complaints, it's... It's uh, you know uh, it's, it's all of the no, stuff in the credit management review credits yep. or um, delivery on time. I'm talking manufacturing here. Um, yeah, defoto, defoto stuff. Yeah, but you know for for health and all the are these just the general sort of measures of of quality or of performance? Is that is that what you, you what what you mean by performance monitoring um, yes. performance? Yes, it's all those measures, it's all those inputs which you'll find in the ISO 9001 standard under 5.6 currently. Right. It's things like the results of reviews, it's things like the status of corrective and preventive actions, it's things like the customers, if you could have healthcare, it's probably patients and caregivers and so on and the like, mm -hmm. um, families and communities and so on. So it's all of these things. As I say, it's very high level. Um, it needs to be considered here. It's not just not just key measures that are associated with um, the reason the organisation exists. What about financial measures? Are you worrying about those? You know, are we making absolutely, a... absolutely? You can't you can't separate financial measures out from any others. Sometimes people keep financial measures away from management review and say they want to keep that to themselves. Is that is is that an issue? Um, I think it is an issue because what it does is it it, cloud, it, it, it it is a potential blind spot. The people who need to make these decisions about what do we actually work on, where, where do we need to make uh, improvements in the business, you may assume that something is very successful but in actual fact, because it, it may be a large amount of activity that's involved in the organisation, but it actually may be very unprofitable. Mm. Um, so to hide that piece of information, we've got to be very careful about that. And I, I certainly do accept the fact that um, in privately owned companies, uh, there's not a great desire to share that information. Yeah. Um, and even with often even with senior managers in the organisation, and I think it also it leads to difficulties and challenges. Uh, with the team because they've only got part of the information which is available in the organisation on which to make decisions and it's always dangerous to have that situation that exists. Yeah and sometimes the, the person holding the purse strings may not uh, always be involved in the management systems and may sit at a, you know, has just, just delegates that down the down the chain and everybody else is dealing with the management system but aren't aware of the financial implications of what they're doing. Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, so I now just want to look at the, um, what the world's highest performing organisations do um, in, in performance review measures. These are the inputs to management review. So there's three key areas here. Um, first, they need to be certain that the information they're reviewing is actually valid that, because they may, may be about to make decisions that could have serious consequences for the company if the information is incorrect. And, and we were just referring before to some financials. Um, if these people are going to make some significant decisions as far as where the organisation is going to go next, um, you certainly want to make sure there's some financial uh, information in there. Secondly, they use it to assess the success and financial health. So even more so, you do need to get some measure of financial health. It's not necessary to actually put out profit and turnover figures here, but some measure of financial health is pretty important to do there. A lot of these are about um, 
it might be uh, variants to targets, for example. So it may be disguised financial information, which is used in a lot of organisations, uh, rather than raw figures and numbers. And I've seen that used quite successfully, uh, where you have budget figures and you can report financial health with respect to budgets and targets um, without using actual raw numbers. Uh, I've seen that used quite successfully. And thirdly, the last thing they want to know is how they're progressing towards their strategic goals and the vision for the organisation. So the inputs you'll usually find at management review time include things like the results of audits, customer complaints, process performance and so on that I mentioned earlier. And these provide little help to managers trying to review these three key areas. So you often get a big divide between what managers need and what they actually get. And the reasons for this I find is either that managers, you know, managers who are reporting this stuff don't actually understand what senior managers actually do at review time, or senior managers delegate the management review task to the QHSE manager without communicating what they actually require. I think most often in my experience it's really a bit of a mix of both. And this divide can easily be bridged through just simple meaningful discussion between senior management and the manager responsible for the integrated management system. And there's no reason why the ISO standard requirements can't be met along with the manager's needs for these performance review measures areas into the management review. So by way of example, the results of audits could be made highly relevant if audits were actually scheduled with these three areas in mind. And this I covered in a little bit more detail uh, in my previous webinar. And I think, Craig, you mentioned uh, the seven keys for an effective audit program. That's the webinar, um, and you should find it actually on the, um, on the Mango uh, yeah. site there if, you, yeah, if yeah. you haven't seen that. Yeah, it's been viewed hundreds of times. Um, ju just a point on these three key, key areas, just with, with, with the auditing, you know, there's there's some independence there, but but with management review, you've got managers in there reviewing their own performance. Is there is there a conflict of interest there that needs to be taken into account? You you could argue there is a conflict of interest. However, um, with with the way boards operate now, um, with a lot of oversight over management, and a lot of boards are handling not only appointments of the CEO, but also have a huge impact an influence on, on who gets to sit around the senior management team table. Uh, and you'll find the scrutiny that comes from boards uh, is very significant. So I, I am less concerned about the, the potential conflicts of interest that you might have yeah. uh, working around a senior management team. Yeah, it's just that in a management review, then some managers might not d discuss or show data that puts them in a bad light. So. You know, you've got to have a good, strong quality manager or a good, strong health and safety manager that can actually present this data back out to say this is yep. the actual performance, um, good or bad. Yep. Look, I quite agree. Um, it, yeah, it needs it needs pretty careful. I, I think the structure that you put around the table and, and particularly around who who are the people who are included in management review, very important activity. Yeah, because the. It, you know the the, the pike going go back to Pike River. That they had two hundred and something, um, you know, uh, incidents reported by the guys, but the board didn't know anything about it because their information was was hidden by the managers. So, you know, the, how you know you, we've just you've got to be very strong and tough to to report everything and every and anything, uh, good or bad. Yeah. Yeah, you, you're quite right, and I think this is what's going to happen now, um, and you've seen it already. I, I mean, I have the latest guidelines and changes, for example, issued by the New Zealand Institute of Directors, uh, and it's uh, their recommendations for directors um, are very significant in, in that they are saying this specific information you need to get from your senior management team. Hmm. So they are becoming far more prescriptive about that. Because after all, they're the ones who are culpable if, if something goes amiss. So they need this information. Um, and, and I think when, when management review systems and structures and the, the attendees at management review, 
I think need to be very carefully thought about and designed and I, I, I believe the board should have a significant role to play in deciding who's there to make sure they have designed a system that is not going to hide information uh, just because one individual manager doesn't want to share that with the team. Mm. Mm. Very good. Okay, keep going. Sorry, you've got 15 minutes. And uh, just a okay. reminder, people can ask questions as we go along. We've, we've got uh, 15 minutes left. Yep, okay, look, I'll wrap this up quite quickly. I just want to talk a little bit more about the suitability and adequacy of, of the management system. Uh, most of you recognise this. Um, it's a slide, the pyramid uh, integrated management system structure that we usually uh, refer to in most organisations where you've got policy at the top, which is what the organisation stands for, what principles and standards it adheres to and what it aims to achieve. Um, in the middle, I guess, you've then got the sort of how. How does the policy um, and it's the what is achieved by the organisation. Then you've got at the work system, or and this occurs at the work system or department level, and then you go down to the lowest levels, which has really got the uh, standard operating procedures, or SOPs, uh, procedures for a particular area or asset or project. And the pyramid shape is just because at the top we have relatively few documents, and as we transition through the layers, we generate 10 or even 100 times as many documents. Um, so this pyramid uh, I showed, as I said last time in, in the previous webinar, what I wanted to um, talk about today though is records and they generally um, are depicted at the bottom of the pyramid because these form the history of our integrated management system. These are the evidence, they're like our rock, the foundation of our, our integrated management system and every time we operate our procedures we create records. Without them, we can't review what happened or understand how to make changes or improve for next time. So it's really through these records that we can be confident we will build on what we learnt today and better understand how to project performance for our businesses tomorrow and what innovations and breakthroughs are involved to meet our future goals. So when we develop our we need to make sure they generate sufficient records for us to be able to review and improve. Similarly, when we develop our SOPs, our work instructions, we need to make sure that we generate sufficient records for us to be able to review and improve those procedures. And it's from our records that we can make an assessment of whether our policy is being adhered to. After all, this is the promise that our CEO made to customers, the board and ultimately to customer shareholders sorry, company shareholders. And also let's not forget staff and contractors and partners who all contribute through following these particular procedures. What we found last time from running the Seven Keys um, webinar was that people got so much out of it but still didn't know quite how to get started. Um, so, we've, uh, so from a management review perspective, uh, it became really difficult for people to provide answers that would really help everybody. So what we agreed to do is to um, include a questionnaire which I've put together and a consultation to help you to get a feel for how you might be able to get your management re review working more effectively in your organisation. And because you've registered for this live webinar, you can download the management review questionnaire. Um, you can work that through um, to get your management review working more effectively for you. If you feel as though you need more help working through the questionnaire, then what I'll do is I'll, you can have a free 30 minute consultation with me where I'll walk you through the, the questionnaire uh, on management review and that's just for attending this live webinar. Uh, you, there's seven days, I'll leave this off, offer open for seven days um, so you can book this consultation with me and here's what the consultation will do. I'll take you through the 21 questions um, so you can I identify what you need to do to improve your management reviews. Well that's pretty generous, so, so, you're, so you're, you're giving 30 minutes free consultation for people on the, on the webinar today? 
A absolutely. However, I do stress the fact that there's limited places um, and you've got seven days to do it. But just, just for attending live here, it's not available, unfortunately, to people who are watching this recorded. Um, but here's how to book it. You go to this address here. This is this is a uh, a link. This address will take you to my diary, where you can book your 30-minute consultation with me. I do stress, though, I've only got limited places, and it's only available to those who are attending live. And it does expire in seven days, so you will need to do it now. So that's timetrade.com/book/slash. JGW5J. Yep. Okay. So, so when I send out the slides early next week, you've got even less time to to book some of Michael's time to help you with your management review meetings. You do indeed. You do indeed. But if you want to, um, you know, if you haven't got a note of that or you can't find that place, then you can always send the, me an email of that. Uh, and there's my email address on the bottom of this slide here, which is my last last slide. And really what I wanted to do was just summarise the points that I really think are, are the key seven final takeaways from this management review session. Um, management review is not a meeting that's held once a year by senior management. That's the first point. The second point is I think you need to bring together data and information across the entire business. And I think you need to look it really open as to where some of this data and information comes from. And I think one of the other things that's happened with the ISO 9001 changes is a lot more emphasis on external parties. So I would say a lot of the data and information you need to bring across the entire business is also that, the, that data and information that affects the external parties. So don't, make sure you include that there. Third, num, point number three, make sure you analyse the data and information and check that it's valid. If you make decisions based on faulty data, you're going to get you're going to be focusing on the wrong things and you could actually kill your kill your organisation. Point number four. Make sure that you've got appropriate levels of reviews carried out um, across the business. Um, for example, if you have got activities that need to be made almost day-to-day -day decisions, then those should be driven down fairly low down the organisation. If they are ones that involve high degree of resources that are required to be moved, to make certain activities, then they're probably going to be made much higher up the organisation. But when you when you conduct reviews by multiple groups of people across the organisation, make sure there's good communications across those groups. I strongly suggest operationalising management reviews. So in other words, get your management review functions and Make sure they, some of those management review functions are carried out as part of the other operational, normal operational management uh, meetings or uh, occasions when other reviews are being carried out. Say, for example, monthly operational meetings could, could include management review in those, is that right? Abs absolutely, yep. And make sure, oh, and I, I talked before about making sure that all levels of the decision makers associated with management review collaborate to avoid duplicating effort. And last but not least, engage with all decision makers just to make sure that their needs are met. Um, and I think this last one is probably one which is the key to getting out of a situation where I find a lot of organisations are where they're just providing information to senior management and then assuming that they're happy with the result. And what happens is it's a box ticking exercise. The way to get out of the box ticking exercise is to sit down with the decision makers and say, what do you actually need mm. when you're making decisions to actually move resources? Yeah, so when I did my uh, external auditor training for to become an ISO 9000 auditor, uh, one of the key, with the two key areas to look at 
in our training was look at the company's internal audits and look at the company's management review meeting minutes. If the management review meeting minutes look like tick the box, then you were, it, it was a trigger to say maybe the systems aren't very strong. So therefore, I was a lot tougher on organizations that just had a tick the box management review. If they had a good management review with good minutes showing you know, all those agenda items you had before and that they're doing good performance reviews and things like that, then I wasn't as tough on those organizations because I knew that they were doing the reviews effectively. So if if there was a, a tick the box management review, then they always got a tough audit. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I quite agree, Craig. You can tell the ones who are just ticking the box. Hmm. You know, I, I just describe them as tire kickers. Uh, you know, they're not serious about, you know, I mean, this, this whole, this whole, Message, I guess, for me, uh, you know, today, you know, quite quickly, is, you know, if you want to make a difference for your business, to me, the key is is get this management review function working right. Get management engaged in actually taking responsibility for this integrated management system. Mm -hmm. After all, it has to reflect how the business operates, and of course, that's one of the key moves that we're expecting uh, with the latest changes to the ISO 9001 standard. Mm -hmm. So that's really all I've got, uh, Craig, just handing um, handing back to you, really. Very good. Do you want to just go to the next slide? So, yeah, so thanks, Michael. So really good thoughts there. Um, you know, surely, you know, a lot of you can take up Michael's offer there and, and get free consulting advice on, on how you do your own management reviews, and Michael can offer some of his uh, cons consultation experience. So uh, take that up with him. As I say, I'll send out the... The, uh, an email early next week with a recording of this and the slides as well, so you can go back and, and maybe share that with your colleagues. Um, and you know, I can't stress how how so important management review is. So so thank you again, Michael. Uh, just for the next webinar, 1 p.m. again, New Zealand time, uh, on the 25th, and I will be presenting Mango. And so for those people that haven't uh, seen Mango or or uh, want to get a free demo of Mango and see uh, how it operates, then uh, why not jump onto that webinar? You'll all get an invitation in, a, in about a week's time, so why not uh, uh, register for that webinar then? So uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, one question there. Um, Michael. My, uh, it's just, yeah, so there's some questions there for you, Michael, that um, uh, maybe, Melissa, if you want to just email Michael direct on that. So um, the uh, Melissa's saying that you've only got one day free there, Michael. But anyway, um, if, Melissa, you want to yeah, email, I... email Michael on that uh, direct, that might might be good. Uh, so, yeah, no, no. Look, just uh, g give me 15 minutes, and I'll get uh, I'll get some um, other other dates cleared for my diary. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you all for attending, and uh, uh, look out for the next webinar. Thank you all. Cheers, bye. Great, thanks, Craig. Thanks, everybody.